Here's the story of Richard Schultes, father of ethnobotany. He revolutionized the way scientists think about plants and drugs, and he did this by living with natives in the jungle. Schultes was the first Harvard biologist with a portable camera and an airplane, and a government mandate to understand the Amazon rainforest. The United States just entered World War II, and the Allied militaries depended on natural rubber from plantations in Southeast Asia. These were all conquered by the Japanese. Adolf Hitler and several international chemical corporations were trying to make better synthetic rubber, but it was too expensive, and most of the wartime demand was for natural rubber. It's just better material for resilience and tensile strength, temperature transition, abrasion, and impact resistance, especially for military aircraft tires. But American rubber tree plantations kept failing because the South American leaf blight disease spreads from tree to tree too easily in the Americas. Henry Ford built an entire city in the jungle called Fordlandia and moved 10,000 people there to look for Amazonian rubber tree varieties to grow on monocrop plantations without the blight. And they failed. So Richard Schultes was assigned by the government to determine the population density of rubber trees in the Amazonian rainforest and to see if the natives there could harvest enough rubber for the military after the Japanese expanded. He collected more than 600,000 seeds and inspected them for blight. And he produced 6,000 viable clones to study in labs, gardens, and greenhouses at research stations around the Northwest Amazon. He effectively propagated blight-resistant, high-yield rubber tree varieties. And he set the grounds for meeting not only the military demand, but all commercial demand for rubber. Then the United States government suddenly teamed up with the petrochemical industry, investing hundreds of millions of tax dollars into processing coal tar, with Nazi chemistry patented by Hitler's IG Farben Corporation, allied with New Jersey Standard Oil Company. They increased the output of cheap synthetic rubber to almost 1 million tons per year by the end of the war, through the big four corporate synthetic rubber agreement. This was advertised as an industrial engineering miracle and Schulte's research was defunded. His research stations were raided, his files were seized, his clones and his seeds were stolen, his gardens and his labs were destroyed, and he was told to enlist in the army as he was no longer needed as a botanist. However, by 1970, all pickup trucks, diesel trucks, and industrial machine tires were made of 90% natural rubber, and in 2024, they still contain around 40% I understand all tires for military, mining equipment, commercial aircraft, and space shuttles are still made from 100% natural rubber. But rubber is another story. Washington, D.C.'s Natural Resource Council also sent Schultes to the Amazon to search for Kurare. This is the name for poisons natives use for hunting in the jungle with blowguns. But anesthesiologists use their active molecules as muscle relaxant for conscious surgery patients. Schultes collected 21 of the ingredients, mostly within his first week of living with natives. Over his career, he explored half a million of the most dangerous square miles of the Amazon, some still unmapped today. He contacted more than 30 tribes and learned to speak and teach in six different language groups. He lived with more than 10 tribes, including the Kofan Poison Masters. He said natives of the Amazon see white people as wild animals without any culture, who reproduce too quickly and spread into regions we don't understand to kill things for fun. He was told there was danger of cannibals where he was traveling, but he chose to go unarmed and live with native guides for more than 14 years. He was a student to the people he encountered, and he said they treated him as a gentleman because he behaved as a gentleman to them. He went missing for months and recovered from malaria and other chronic illnesses more than 12 times through the knowledge and care of Amazonian natives. A pharmaceutical company wanted him to find specimens of Virola theodora. Amazonians used this plant as a psychotropic snuff, but also to treat fungal infections. At first, scientists could not isolate the antifungal compounds until the correct specimens of the correct varieties were collected by natives at the correct time. Schulte said there is no apparent morphological difference between chemically active and non-active varieties. But natives can tell the difference at a glance through indicators Western scientists do not consider. He said even the Amazonian children knew more about the native plants than any university professor. What we should do is concentrate on those plants that people in these societies have found have some effect on the human body.
Schultes hated the word shaman, and he said these languages do not have concepts of worship or gods like we have in European languages. He called his teachers in the jungle medicine men and medicine women because he saw them as biologists with practical visions about the illnesses and medicines and their ecosystems. None of this should be compared to religious experience, and world religions could never replace these traditions. They could only be understood in and for themselves. They are not people frozen in time, and this is not nostalgia for the past. These are the stewards of a living and transforming system, and we need to learn from them. Schultes was the first to say indigenous peoples should benefit from any medical drugs they help scientists discover, and they should retain control of their own territories according to their own traditions. He said poison, medicine, and hallucinogen were all one in the jungle and natives knew how to prepare them and use them for countless generations of nuance, study, and practice. They knew which species to combine to inhibit their stomach enzymes, and they knew how to purify ash into chemical salts, extract cyanide from roots, and purge themselves safely if they were poisoned. They were intimately familiar with the fine lines between intoxication, medication, paralysis, and death. Yes, Schultes was fully initiated to Yege mysteries through overnight ceremonies in native longhouses, with multiple tribes and many different recipes. He snorted yeki and yopo snuff scraped off the tips of poisoned darts. He sat in on the traditional use of peyote, datura, and coca leaves, and he was rescued by maku nomads with their mysterious Teraptoris methistica when he was lost and sick. Everything is poison. Nothing is poison. When he came back to the industrialized world, he worked with chemists and pharmacologists everywhere to try to understand what he just experienced. He described ayahuasca as an umbilical cord linking humans to our ancestral knowledge through collective visions about the natural world. Richard Schultes introduced Gordon Wasson to Maria Sabina in Mexico and helped Albert Hoffman isolate psilocybin. But he never would have guessed what would have come from this. Why do these few plants, out of a half a million in the world, have these unearthly uh, effects on the mind? He was like a Starfleet captain sent to the planet's frontiers with the best available technology, trained by the most advanced university. But he was also like Gandalf, befriending the locals, humble enough to admire them and learn from them about their plants and cultures. He collected more than a quarter million wild plant specimens, 25,000 of them with modern economic or medical value, 3,000 of them never collected before, 300 of them never heard of before. He wrote 10 books and 496 scientific papers, taught hundreds of students, and helped to create protected national parks in the Amazon rainforest. He described it as an ancient library. And he said we should see the natives there as generational scientists already deployed in the field with advanced knowledge of natural resources. His photographic journal is published in The Lost Amazon, and this is the first book I recommend as a cornerstone to the entire discipline of ethnobiology. But that's really only the tip of the iceberg, so if you want to come along for some adventures in heresy and keep learning with me about biological exploration, ethnosciences, and biotechnologies, then subscribe to our channel, Jungle Magi Fellowship. And check out our website, junglemagi.com, for our collection of articles, images, and videos. This is an independent research initiative for the synthesis of indigenous thought and globalized sciences, and I wish you strength and honor in the unimaginably strange times ahead of us.